One of the great things about social media is you get to learn from great people. We're here with Joe Fernell, and I've learned a lot following you on LinkedIn. But now today at the Fiber Connect 2021, you're going to be kind of giving your insight about some of the challenges of rural broadband. If you can give us a preview of that, that'd be great. I am. We're going to talk about rural broadband challenges here in about an hour. And, uh, you know, if, if you know anything about rural America, you know that uh, it's not easy to get to often. So, you know, I think the most obvious, and, and there are the obvious challenges to deploying broadband in rural markets, and that's distance, density, terrain, and weather. And, and I'm in rural Oregon, rural Washington, and we certainly have a lot of that. You know, mountainous country, long distances, vast open spaces with nobody in them, weather that's sometimes crazy hot, sometimes crazy cold, lots of snow, wind, all of it. Pretty much anything you can imagine. Well, we don't have hurricanes <laughs> in Oregon or Washington. Uh, so the, the distance density and terrain issues are real. And most people have already thought about those and they've looked at ways to overcome them or they have metrics to figure out how to, you know, can we afford to get there and, and build. With the cost of fiber deployments coming down over the years, the last mile is becoming less of a problem, even in less dense communities. It's sometimes, how do we get there? So the middle mile, and we heard this morning that there's actually some discussion about money for middle mile in the big transportation package at the federal level. And that's the first time we've heard that. And I'm, I'm really gratified to hear that because then there's a recognition that especially out West with all of these distances, sometimes the biggest barrier, the single biggest barrier to deployment is middle mile access. In Oregon, it's interesting. We have we have lots of fiber in Oregon, but m many of the, the long haul fibers don't have on and off ramps because they were built to serve data centers. And so they weren't designed with end customer aggregation. They were designed for security between data centers or coming from an offshore undersea data cable that lands on the coast of Oregon and then goes to a data center or, or uh, an, an inter internet exchange. So even though we have fiber in some of these really remote places, we can't get access to it. And when talking with the providers, they, the owners of that fiber, well, we didn't envision needing an on and off ramp there because that's not why we built this fiber, even though they have a huge surplus of fiber in the sheath. So, you know, one of the things that I would recommend, especially if you're a long haul provider and you're building, think about on and off ramps, even if it's just a segment of the fiber that's in the sheath you know, in these, in these areas, because once you build fiber through there, it, the chances of building another middle mile stretch through there uh, is rare. Resiliency of middle mile fiber is another issue that people don't think about, but natural disasters, we had all the wildfires in the West last year. We have more going on right now. The biggest fire in, in the United States is, is down in Southern Oregon, South Central Oregon. In many cases, there's one middle mile fiber run running into the communities that, that are served out in, in those rural markets. And if it's even if it's underground, it can be melted with some of these fires. So resiliency of middle mile. Having redundancy, path redundancy, right? Path redundancy. And it, of course, obviously, you ultimately want to have provider redundancy as well. So if you have an electronic failure at a, at a higher level with a single provider, but I mean, I would just be happy with middle mile fiber to begin with, and then path redundancy uh, as well. And uh, and you know, we think about um, accessibility even in some of the urban markets. There are entire neighborhoods sometimes that have been bypassed that still have old DSL, and so they're struggling to keep up, especially with the the higher demand work from home. And that brings me to one of the things that. I don't hear anybody talking about at the national level, but I, I do hear the trade associations they're talking about it, the providers get it, but we still don't have a national plan for digital literacy. So we get the tool to these people. You know, it's like handing somebody a hammer that has never used a hammer before. What do they do with it? How, you know, some people are going to go, man, I think I can use this. And they're going to kind of intuitively figure it out because that's who they are. Some people are going to go, this is really cool. I'm going to hang on to it in case I figure out. But I'm not really, I'm going to hang it on a shelf and they're going to get limited use out of it. Some people are just going to throw it away or give it away because they don't know what to do with it. Access to the internet is just like that. Just because you get a connection to somebody's house 
that is reliable and scalable and fast and you've got up and download speeds doesn't mean that they know how to uh, access telehealth and telemedicine or work from home or you know one of the the stories I heard from one of my employees about the distance education during the pandemic was you know she and her husband were, were both working and they come from a Hispanic you know their family is all Hispanic so her parents were watching her children trying to help them with school and her parents speak English but it's a second language and so there's this barrier where they're trying to figure out the technology to help the kids with their homework and, and they all just got frustrated. So this employee of mine, when she got home from an eight hour day at work, she would fix supper, she would wash clothes, she'd clean the kitchen, then she'd stay up until about midnight or one o'clock in the morning helping her kids with their homework wow. and then get up the next morning and do it all over again. So we weren't helping, we, you know, the internet service provider weren't helping people learn how to use those tools. So digital literacy is a big one, I think. And there, there are others. I mean, I, I'm gonna talk about the shiny object today. You know, 5G and this this infatuation we have as a nation with shiny objects. Right. And you know, and if you've, if you've paid any attention to what's going on in the United States with telecom over the last three years, 5G is gonna save us in rural America and, and every 5G engineer out there is going, no, that's not really what it's designed for. But, you know, we had this fascination with shiny objects and then low Earth orbit satellites. Same thing. They're going to save us, but they don't have the upload capacity to handle a lot of the, the, the two way interaction that we have with applications now that we've learned with the telehealth and tele telemedicine, the distance education, the work from home, Zoom calls. Well, why can I see everybody, but you can't see me on a Zoom call and set upload speed? So, you know, our fascination with these shiny objects and we keep throwing money at them when they're not really going to solve our problem long term. I'm going to talk about that today, too. That makes sense. And uh, the thing back to the middle mile, is there a call to action to these providers, the big data center people who may also own that fiber? You know, could they somehow, you know, provide a wavelength or provide a, a dark fiber? And, and save the country a lot of money. You know, the, the challenge is they've, they're, they've got an investment in the fiber and the, the investment in the, in the fiber is from point A to point B. So if you take a fiber and you take an off-ramp in the middle, then from that off-ramp all the way to point B is stranded fiber. It's a stranded asset that likely nobody else is gonna use. And, that, and so I understand that this is a problem. So I, I I love the fact that we're at least starting to have the conversation about it at the federal level. And we're having that conversation in Oregon right now, but middle mile. And all of the big providers are involved because, you know, they don't want the black eye of dry, you know, driving fiber right through a rural remote community and not helping, you know, but that's not how that was engineered. So I think the awareness is a big piece of that. And, and maybe at some point, if there is a subsidy for middle mile that then there's a requirement for on and off ramps so that that it it becomes part of our culture to make sure that we do that it's just uh, like an interstate has on and off ramps right. to those towns right right well you know the last thing we want is a toll road that starts at point a and goes to point b and gets you there really fast but nobody can get on in the middle and right. that's you know that's kind of what we built right and it seems like there's other opportunities. I, I think of pipelines, right? I mean, it's a million dollars a mile to build a natural gas pipeline, and there's a lot of right of way. Granted, it might not be near anything, but it might be. Well, you know, right of way issues are a big issue, I mean, nationally. And, you know, if you think about, you know, I think about Tillamook County in Oregon, and, and if you've heard about Tillamook ice cream or Tillamook cheese, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's world class. And I, I think they actually talked about they have it here at the hotel in Nashville, and they were so proud they've got Tillamook cheese here. And uh, so that comes from Tillamook County. So it's this big dairy farming community on the coast of Oregon, the north coast of Oregon. Tillamook County, about a third of the communities in Tillamook County do not have, they're not, they're not, um, they're not actually incorporated communities. So they don't have public rights of way. Mm. So now as a provider, if I want to go in there and build fiber there, because I mean, I'm working with Tillamook County, they really desperately want fiber to the home. How do I do that? That means legally I have to negotiate an easement with every single homeowner oh to build fiber across their easement. And uh, some states, including Oregon, have passed legislation now that that if the if there's an electrical right of way, and in Oregon it, it's this is specific to cooperatives, electric cooperatives, 
But if there's already an electrical right of way, an easement for electricity, you can actually add telecommunications to that as long as there's no financial harm to the owner. And we all know having fiber to the home available at your home actually increases the value of your property. So the chances of being, there being financial harm are pretty, sl pretty slim. Um, we're hoping in Oregon, and that passed this year, we're hoping in Oregon that we can add the, the public utility districts or people's utility districts, PUDs, to that next year. So that because actually in Tillamook County, it's all PUD. So I can't solve that problem there. But for rural markets, even even in a community where that's unincorporated, the easement and public right of way is really an issue. Then you get into permitting on federal lands and state lands and park lands and uh, there's a construction firm here that is actually doing some work for a service provider that's building uh, fiber into Grand Tetons National Park. And I can't even I can't even fathom the permitting nightmare that that must be. So we talk about in Oregon having a whole government approach to solving the digital divide and providing for digital equity. So every governmental entity is 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 tasked and measured on their contributions to solving the digital divide. And if you did that at the federal level, then the Parks Department would be mandated. It would be part of their mission to help with this. You know, the Forestry Service would be, it would be part of their mission. But short of that, they're gonna, they're gonna stay with the status quo and you know, we're gonna wait two years for a permit. Railroad crossings, you know, irrigation canal crossings, all of those are very difficult and can slow down projects literally by years. So we got to figure that out too. And I think the whole government approach to that is the is the answer, where we all are in this together. That makes a lot of sense. And and Joe, I really appreciate your time. Oh, it's fun. You. Yeah, insight. I appreciate you interviewing me. And thanks for being here. This <laughs> is a good, good conference.